Welcome to High Noon, where we have interesting conversations uh, with controversial people. John McWhorter really needs no introduction, but I'll go through the formalities anyway. He's a professor of linguistics at Columbia University and hosts a podcast on his subject of expertise called Lexicon Valley. He's also a co-host of The Glenn Show, along with the great Glenn Lowry at Blogging Heads TV. And he has two books out right now in different formats, Nine Nasty Words, English in the Gutter, Then, Now, and Forever, was just released uh, early this month, while The Elect, on the subject of race and the development of a woke religion, uh, has been published in the chapters available uh, for subscribers to his Substack and will be available soon in, and I believe, in a more traditional format. Is that right, John? I'm not allowed to say, but yes. <laughs> Can't give details. Uh, well, welcome. It's an honor to have you here on High Noon. Um, I'd like to start out by tying your two books together, and I know you've tried to do this in various formats, and it's not, uh, there's, there's no perfect nexus between them, but I was wondering if this idea of the elect, and I know you don't even like the word woke, but um, of this this ideology uh, as a religion, if, if it somehow came to you through your work with language, through your work with profanity, seeing as we have moved from essentially the category of profanities being related to blasphemy to now the, the blasphemy in our society has to do with identity or slurs about identity. Is that maybe where, or at least part of how you came up with that idea? That is um, a very interesting way of parsing it, but the truth is I'm not, I'm not that organic and the two books are really very separate. Nine Nasty Words is primarily just a jolly ramble through various bad words and what their histories are and what their histories are with me, etc. Of course, one of the chapters is on the N-word and how sacred it has become. That wasn't what I was thinking about when I wrote the book, though. It wasn't really the most important thing. I would have written that chapter even if I weren't Black, because I just basically feel that slurs have become a kind of profanity, and so we think of them in that way. What happened later with the book that's being serialized at Substack and that will exist in relatively short order as a book, although I can't talk about it at this point because Nine Nasty Words is supposed to be what's in publicity. But that book just came because last summer it started to absolutely infuriate me the way various people were being defenestrated for no good reason based on other sacred concepts. And so the N-word does happen to be one of them. And so I guess if you did, if somebody were going to do a movie about my life or something like that, they might knit these things together and have it be that I was thinking mostly about the N-word in two different ways. But really, I'm two people. And there's the jolly linguist, and then there's the cranky race commentator. And the two books come from the two different me's. Well, uh, I guess the other parallel I would see between the two different yous would be that so much of what you call the elect's power comes from words, right? Uh, yeah. Comes from the fear of being either a racist or white supremacist, or at least called one, um, especially online, especially on Twitter, where everybody can see it. Uh, there's also, though, the corresponding worry. Of course, we do want these words to have some power. Right. Um, we don't want mm -hmm. people to be blase about being called a racist or a white supremacist. Um, mm -hmm. How do we strike a, a balance around the power of those two words or, or related words where they retain enough social opprobrium where, you know, you don't have people out and proud to be racist or to say racist things, um, but not so much power that they really seem to have silenced by by a lot of polls up to 65 percent of, of well-meaning americans when they discuss politics or anything of cultural import yeah it's kind of like in an old cartoon where two characters are running and they run outside of the frame and you can see the edge of the film we actually reached the point that you're talking about of a kind of civic agreement about racism terms it was about 20 years ago i miss say the year 2000 maybe the 1990s in general, where it was well established that being a racist was a bad thing, that leveling words like the N-word was a very bad thing, but you could use the N-word in reference with taste without being kicked out of your job. There was a, a sacralization that had not happened yet to the extent that it has now. So yeah, we want there to be agreements that there are certain ways of using language that will not be allowed. The problem is when it gets to the point that you're being accused of committing the sin without having done it, when you're being accused of being a racist, when you haven't done anything that a normal society would consider racist, or when you're accused of leveling a slur when what you were doing was referring to it, often in criticism of it, and nevertheless
unless everybody pretends that that's the same thing as calling somebody the word. That's an excess that we have slipped into today, I think. Yeah, and and in your role as a linguist, you've you've stuck to describing, right? Describing language. You've always maintained a certain kind of non-judgmentalism, perhaps about the direction of where where words have gone. And what you just described with the N word, it 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 is in some sense an organic, or at least until very recently, an organic transformation, a kind of collective alchemic process, or uh, I, I don't know the words. That's never a phrase you want to say in front of a linguist, but I, I can't find the right words um, to describe it. But but basically that you know, sort of being overly fussy or standing against the tide of where language is changing is a hopeless enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm thinking now more about how language has been used uh, in our politics of late and how, for example, the word equity has sort of been artificially inserted on purpose to, I think, to confuse people uh, where, where they used to use the word equality. And of course, those two have very different meanings mm -hmm. um, or, or the way that um, names for identities continue what's appropriate uh, to call like BIPOC. I don't even know how to pronounce that, but um, I'm I think that's not in academia, <laughs> um, but but the the evolution of those terms seems not so much organic or collective in, in that kind of normal process, but a very conscious top down academic exercise that is then enforced with social opprobrium or, or um, enforced with that fear of being called uh, a, called a racist or called something else that you don't want to be called uh, in front of a lot yeah. of people. How, yeah. how does that organic versus inorganic change of language seem to you as a linguist? Well, I think you're touching on a lot of things. And one of them is that I don't know that these terms such as um, Systemic racism, equity, et cetera, that have very particular meanings that have to be very carefully learned. I don't know if the people using those words are on purpose leveling them upon us in order to make life hard. I think that subgroups of people have a way of developing jargons that end up being very transparent to them. And usually we don't really have to pay attention. You know, literature professors have words that they use that we never use in those ways. And well, you know, let them have it. But in this case, we're talking about something that began as a theory of the law among a small community of people who were legal scholars. And rather suddenly it's being applied to all of society. So that we have these words that we never knew were used in this particular way. And of course, the people can be scolds in trying to get us to understand the difference between equality and equity. But I think what they're upset about is that they wish that all of the world viewed how the world was supposed to go the way they do. I think it's less a matter of language than about their idea that battling power differentials has to be at the center of all intellectual, moral, and artistic endeavor. BIPOC is something that responds to the fact that identity is crucial to this whole school of thought. The idea is that if you are not roughly a white man, then you're in really serious trouble and the essence of your existence is oppression. And so the idea is to reconceive what I think normal senses of one's humanity and one's individuality are in favor of this idea of Mitt Romney is on top and everybody else is on the bottom. And that means more words. It means that you have to fashion different labels. And BIPOC very nicely gets across the idea that if you're not Mitt Romney, you are a single something else. And so there needed to be an acronym for this. If you're standing on the outside of all of this, it can look rather Confusing, and it can also seem deliberate. I think, though, that the deliberateness is in the social program, less in the language. So when you talk about power, which, by the way, I think is one of the more impoverished ways of looking at relationships between people, except in very limited circumstances. But when we talk about power, how is it that we can talk so much about power in the discourse and yet we, we are silent on the power of, of um, exactly what we were talking about, right? Obviously, there's enormous power in being able to accuse somebody of being a racist here. I'm thinking especially with there's some, some class dimension of this, like what happened in Sw Smith College, um, where you have somebody who's just working for the university and can be um, accused without, uh, it turns out, without merit of, be, of being a racist, and then you could lose your job, you could lose your social circle. I mean, how is it that in all of this talk about power, we never talk about that power? Well, it's because we're talking about a religion. What I have called the elect is not just a group of people. It's not a political program. These people are a religion. And if we just shook everything else 
if we if we shook everything up and assigned labels again, and it wasn't about tradition, we would very readily label the elect as the same kind of body of humans as Mormonism. It's the exact same thing. And so, because it's a religion, there are certain aspects of it that do not make strict sense. You have to sequester your sense of sequential logic to an extent. And within the elect religion, there is a fundamental idea that you are always speaking truth to power. The fundamental idea is that your job is to show that you're not a racist and that by definition, most of the world is, and you are spreading the good news by showing that you are not a racist. The whole impetus needs there to be unconverted heathen, so to speak. And as such, it's very hard for the elect to understand that they actually are in power now because it's their definition, their self-definition, that they're speaking truth to it. If there were no power to speak truth to, the elect religion would have no reason for being. And so the people who are part of this religion are not inclined to admit their success. In their mind, no matter what happens, no matter what society is like, they will always be out of power and shaking their fists at the heavens. That's why they don't like to acknowledge that they have become the power. I mean, is is there a certain element of prosperity or or a sort of success in all of this that um, they can't admit that they've essentially won some of these battles? I mean, I remember when I was uh, I, I grew up in the Bay Area, which, by the way, uh, I do use the term "flip a bitch" for you terms. <laughs> Um, so you know that one, yeah. I know this one. Um, but I grew up in the Bay Area, and even by the time I was in high school, let's say in the mid-2000s, um, I, I called it, perhaps politically incorrectly, Selma Envy. Like, I, I had you yeah. know, very privileged, uh, mostly white kids around me. I literally had a friend of mine say, I feel like protesting something this weekend. What's going on that we could protest, right? Actually uh, said that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there some element to this that is just uh, a function of, of not having the kind of struggles that perhaps people did face even 50 years ago or 70 years ago that we have the time to, it, it seemingly, it, it often at least, it seems an awful lot like inventing, inventing things uh, to struggle against at this point. One hates to say that there's a there is truth in that, and one hates even more to say that there's a lot of truth in that. There is a Selma envy, and maybe a kinder way of looking at it is that, especially if you're a black person who has not suffered unduly, it's easy to think that it's your job to continue the struggle, as it's put, and that's fine, that things are not perfect and you want to still be of service, but it's harder to find what to do these days because the issues are not as implacable and stark and grievous as they were. So yeah, to an extent, you look for something to protest because you have it set that you're going to protest because the situation is still not perfect and your forebears protested and they made your life possible, so you have to protest. But yeah, unfortunately, under our circumstances, because so much progress has been made, to an extent you have to look for something to protest. And then there's also simply the fact that to be a professional victim is a personality type. You can be white, you can be green, you can be black. It's a personality type to stress victimization as your entire identity. That is a kind of identity that is very tempting for a black person because you can use our race conversation as the fuel for it. And so there is a personality type, and unfortunately it's rather common, where the idea is that you feel comfortable in attesting to your victimhood. It's your comfort zone to depict yourself as, frankly, more victimized than you actually are. And I stress that's a human type. It, it's not something unique to black people, but we are encouraged to OD on that. And that is what you're seeing. That's the Selma envy. Yeah. I'm, I'm hardly the first person to highlight this, but um, as a woman, it, it seems to me that a lot of what you just said about the temptation of this victimhood identity um, really does apply, even though the prism that we've seen this ideology, the elect, since last summer has primarily been in about race. It, it definitely seems to me like there's something parallel growing up around sexism or sex that uh, really has the potential for a similar kind of discourse. And you're right, it's it's so tempting. I mean, if, if I feel like if I'd been fed this as a teenager, I would have grabbed onto it with both hands just to be lazy. This Feels is a good. human tendency, you know what I yeah. mean? It's a great way to to let yourself off the hook for, you know, anything that's hard. I mean, do you, do you worry that this is migrating not just uh, from our conversation about race, but 
then to our conversation about sexism and sex. And then, you know, who knows from there um, what the next level, I guess it's already gender identity or sexual orientation. I mean, how many layers of identity can we make central to this conversation and therefore in, in some way taboo? Yeah, it's tough. There's a central problem in American culture right now, which is that there is a such thing as crying wolf in terms of victimhood or exaggerating vastly. And we don't have a way of calling people on it in a way that we're comfortable with because we're also really committed to acknowledging people's actual victimhood. And we realize that the victimhood doesn't have to be somebody punching you in the face or calling you a dirty name. We're advanced. We realize that, say, sexual harassment cannot go in a way that people 30 years ago didn't. But what that means is that if there's an extent to which people are claiming grievances because they have a victim complex, because it feels good to shake your fists at the sky, because it feels good to have a group of people that you can claim victimhood with. We all know that there's an element of that in black people, in people of other colors. I have to tread lightly, but certainly with women as opposed to men, etc. Yeah, we all know. Where do you draw the line? How do you draw the line? That's something that thinking America needs to work on, because too often our choice is either to just let people run over us with clearly false and self-indulgent claims, or then on the other hand, you end up just pushing people out and denying genuine victimhood and being unsubtle. There has to be something in between. We have to work on that because that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is I, I sometimes have a difficult time telling who's sincere uh, and who isn't and who's mm -hmm. using some of this concept of fragility or victimhood as a political weapon. So relatedly to this entire phenomenon, it seems to me that another trend in our language as of late has been almost a therapeutic language, right? Um, there's, for example, we have politicians, people who have enormous amounts of power, right? They're making very important decisions for the entire country, claiming to be emotionally or psychologically traumatized as part of normal political discussion. Of course, there's the overanalyzed phenomenon of the trigger warnings. Um, but but now the, the language of harassment and abuse, right? I'm thinking Taylor Lorenz saying that it's it's a harassment or targeting um, to use her, her profile photo for, for her columns on TV. I mean, increasingly public life in America uh, seems to be one big therapy session, linguistically speaking. Um, I mean, what does this all say about us? If, it, if, if our profanity says something about us as a society, what does it say about us that our dominant mode of discussion now is so heavily dependent on language that until I think maybe at least from my observation five, ten years ago would have been confined to a therapist's couch? Yeah, it's a very weird moment that we're in where we're taught that what a therapist would think of as sanity, what psychology tells us our normal human coping skills given the basic difficulties that anybody is going to counter in life we're being told that that is is too 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 much to expect that that is expecting people to be too strong and that we're supposed to give vent to our slightest discomforts and talk about those discomforts as if we were practically being physically abused. I have never seen anybody actually try to make sense of that. The kind of person who says that they feel victimized by A, B, or C that nobody would have batted an eyelash at, say, 10 minutes ago. I've never heard one of those people challenged to express how they consider that to be genuine adult coping behavior. And of course, they might say, well, we need to change what we think of as tolerable. But of course, there's some people who clearly are just profiting from the fact that there's such a market for you know, showing oneself to be that kind of victim. It's an odd moment. The coddling of the American mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt very eloquently shows that we're basically teaching people to be what a therapist would consider a broken person. That needs to be talked about more. But it's interesting. I was um, on a, am I allowed to say this? No, given what happened, I am just going to say it. The National Book Critics Circle, I was on the board and that particular book made it. It was one of the 10 finalists for nonfiction, but it couldn't get any further because 
some of the people there didn't like the fact that the right wing might agree with a lot of the premises of the book. And I found that interesting because what that means is that the premises of that book are now regarded as dangerous thought by a certain kind of person where it wouldn't have been, say, just 10 years ago. I'm glad you brought up the right because uh, it seems to me that there is this very eclectic or heterodox group of people um, who are starting to find a lot of commonalities in in simply opposing uh, this phenomenon, whatever we want to term it, uh, the elect, the wokeism, which uh, cancel culture, that's also a, a phrase that's gone, um, sort of jumped the shark and is, is completely uh, imprecise now. But there seems to be a certain amount of pushback that is formulating, and it seems to be coming both from the liberal left and from the center, but also from the right. Um, you know, do you think one that this kind of coalition is is democratically viable, small d, um, or do you think there's too much that we disagree on? Um, and then, second, you know, do you think that Trump's departure from the national stage has empowered the elect or? Uh, has turbocharged or turbocharged them or or has actually um, lessened their power in some way? No, I think that um, that second question is interesting because I think part of why they were able to take over in the way that they were, especially last summer, was partly because there was a Trump in office and a Trumpism that was convenient to rail at as something that was very dangerous. And I agreed. That was my judgment of, of Trump as well. However, his departure hasn't really changed it because the elect have acquired so much power that now they can just sit and wield it. And it's inherent to that religion that the present is always a complete nightmare. So if they don't have Trump, then they'll have have something else. It's very interesting to see a lot of them working really hard to find mean things to say about President Biden already, because it, th things can never be good according to this religion. But in terms of the coalition that's moving against the elect, I don't know if it would ever stay a coalition, but I think that because of the nature of things, it would have to be the people who were left or left-ish who had the most effect, especially given that a lot of those people have a certain visceral contempt for anybody who is right of center. But what needs to be understood is that the elect are not just liberals, they are hard, hard leftists who are telling the rest of us that if we are not as hard left as them, we're immoral beings. It's up to the rest of the left to you know, plant their feet on the ground and say, no, we, we will not be castigated like this and you are not going to take all the oxygen out of the room. But it's been so quick that I think a lot of people on just the left are still catching their breath and trying to figure out who these people are. I think that'll start to happen in particular this summer. So, because that was that you're kind of preceding what I was going to ask, because it seems like they haven't, you know, present company aside and a handful of, of really great folks on the liberal left um, who have stood up against this, you know, the Harper's letter signatories and so on. Uh, it seems like the institutions are just very easy to topple for, for the elect, right? So thinking about the New York Times, of course, academia has been captured for a long time. Um, it, do you have any insight on why it might have been so easy to push? And we're talking about pushing out people who did have enormous amount of power within these various organizations for very minor uh, transgressions against against this religion. I mean, mm -hmm. why was it so easy? You know, I genuinely think, and I'm I'm working on this, and we need to see. I think a lot of it was something rather mundane. We tend to forget that most of this happened online. Most of these things happened at Zoom meetings. Everything going crazy starting last June, not an accident, it was then. I think the pandemic had something to do with this. I think that the Zoom format, the fact that we're not breathing in each other's faces and being in the same room with each other after the meetings and things, I think that it has encouraged a kind of extremism. You can have these chats alongside that can be very animated. You can't do that in a room. All of that, I think, creates a kind of Lord of the Flies atmosphere that will be less when people start sitting in rooms again. And I think we'll start seeing more resistance to the sorts of things that organizations have so quickly done in the name of all their employees, many of whom are sitting in the Hollywood squares kind of thinking, oh, goodness, that'll be different if it isn't the meeting isn't over once you turn off your computer. I think when people are actually in the same place again, maybe we'll see some kind of 
normality. You know, it's strange to imagine that 2019 was normal. But I think that what happened, what you and I are talking about was partly because the only way anybody's been interacting is the way you and I are now. I think it's easier to get away with nonsense in this format than it would be if people were actually in reality. Well, there, there's certainly that phenomenon where bi people are way more polite in, in person than they are when they can be anonymous or even not anonymous online or that the similar, I think there's a similar phenomenon between people being rude drivers. But if you bump into somebody on the street, you're like, oh, excuse me. Exactly. You know? Yeah, uh, we've been driving since that. last summer. Exactly. Uh, in, in a different forum, you noted the connection between, I think, uh, an aspect of modernity, right? The fading away of traditional religion um, and perhaps in some forms, traditional identity, right? Um, and some of those things are, are good, right? In the sense that we don't want an intense tribal identity where we're just all, you know, fighting the other tribe and um, we completely give it up our individuality in order to survive. And certainly I'm, I'm with my background is from Eastern Europe. So I'm certainly no no collectivist <laughs> in, in thinking. Um, but there is this big argument on the right as to whether, within the right mostly, whether we've jettisoned too much of, of a sort of true collective, um, that we've lost, for example, our ability to identify as a collective of Americans, or that the fading away of traditional religion, and I, I speak as, as an atheist here, um, has has really uh, created a perfect storm for people to raise these these what once were important but not all consuming aspects of our identity to the level of a religion. I think the phrase you use, and I'm, I'm probably slightly misquoting here, but it's not natural for us to think of, of ourselves as individuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you maybe elaborate a little that, on that a little bit more? And, and can we build a society of individuals or do we have to have some kind of collective identity or else we'll have worse forms of it? Yeah, this is a serious problem. We're dealing with what Rousseau warned us about, which is that, you know, probably in many ways, the best state of society is when you're dealing with a few hundred people living by the river. Nobody in a situation like that can have an identity crisis. You know what you are. You're somebody's brother, you're somebody's son, you're somebody's friend, and you die at 60. There you go. That is not anything any of us would be waiting for, but yeah. You don't want to be an individual. And if you're in a nation that has a very strong national identity, usually a small one, then part of your identity is you are an Estonian. That's easy. I'm picking Estonia just randomly, but it's easy for an Estonian. If you're in a society like ours, your religion used to provide you with that. But to the extent that religion becomes something ever more distant for ever more people, at least of a certain level of education and or social class, then you are going to have these substitute identities. An awful lot of what we're seeing is people seeking to feel connected to other groups of people. And that means that when you have the old fashioned balkanization going away, then you start having weird replacements. And so to be a black person, it used to be that because no matter what kind of black person you were, you were largely barred from the best that society had to offer. There were certain things you couldn't do. There were certain places you couldn't go. You were looked upon with open scorn by all other people. So you didn't wonder who you were because all black people were part of a certain community. Once that changes as a black person, especially a rather affluent one, you might start looking for some other source of tribalism. And for us in America, often that tribalism is that you seek the tribalism of victimhood. You seek the tribalism of defeatism. And that is something you could have almost predicted. Where do you go from there? That is a good question. If people need to feel like they belong to something, if it's not going to be a bowling league, it's going to be pretending that it hurts you to have your average or not look right on a screen. Where you go from there is something we're all going to have to talk about. <laughs> uh, so uh, do, you, do you think in that regard, we've lost the ability to be weirdos? I mean, you probably have a better word for this, but um, it seems to me that because our identities have risen to this hugely important level, um, and, and it's, as you said, getting the collectives are getting so large that it's, it's almost like everybody has to endorse every quirk of a person, um, except those, of course, which are forbidden. Um, <laughs> but everybody has to endorse every one of our weirdnesses or, or strange aspects of our personality, and they have to be raised to the level of celebration in society, or they're somehow, um, we're being oppressed or we're being victimized in some way. I mean, I I've been thinking a lot about this question recently about, you know, 
the beauty of being a weirdo and, and developing these weird little subcultures or countercultures, it seems like that's kind of fading in a way, especially, and it's especially weird given the fact that it's easier than ever on the internet to find other weirdos who share your particular weirdness. But do you think that aspect of societal endorsement in some way really squashes these fun little communities that pop up in opposition to the dominant culture? <laughs> well, I think what's important is that it would be a community. Most people don't want to be weird alone. But yeah, I think that we do have a certain amount of that. It's looking very attractive. This gets back to critical race theory. It, it's it's made to seem very attractive to have yourself be part of some very large story of some group that has suffered at the hands of white people in some way. And that can be many white people as well. You know, it's not hard to fashion yourself as part of an oppressed group of some kind. And yeah, that's marketed literally and figuratively. And it does, I think, discourage people from being individuals as in weird in that way. In general, most people have never wanted to be individuals, but this is a time that definitely doesn't encourage it, except for the fact that, yeah, if you are weird, you can find more people who are weird like you online. And that feeds right back into your being part of a community. Being the solitary weirdo, rarer these days, I would definitely say. So to, to wrap this up, I have a few kind of short fire questions um, unrelated to each other, but just thoughts that I wanted to ask okay. you. Um, is, is English the language of the foreseeable future because it's the language of the internet? Yes, English will be like this unless the world gets blown up and started again. It will not be Mandarin because Mandarin is frankly too hard and it's utterly impossible to read or write. So English took it. And I frankly think English is a rather ugly language, but this is gonna be the one. Other languages will survive, but English is the, the real Esperanto. What is your favorite language? Russian. I think it's just magnificently complicated and beautiful. I, I love that piece of your book where you talked about how, and I don't know how many swear words I'm allowed to use on this podcast, but um, <laughs> how, how English has transformed ass into so many different <laughs> ways. Apparently Russian does the same thing with dick. With, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I was wondering what it says about us, like Americans versus Russians, that we chose those various body parts to turn into. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if it is anything. And then Russian also, I use dick because that's better coming from a guy. But if you know Russian, you know that the female word is also used quite colorfully in Russian, far beyond anything in English. And so, yeah, I don't know what that says about the cultures, but it is fun. Uh, this one is for my, for my husband. Uh, what's your favorite dinosaur? Parasaurolophus um, is my favorite. It's one of the duck-billed dinosaurs, and it has the big, long horn that looks kind of like a hairstyle. I think I've always liked the way Parasaurolophus looked. I have a balsa skeleton, little foot high skeleton of parasol office that I'm looking at right now. So I would say that is one of my favorites. And I also like the abelosaurs. They're kind of like tyrannosauruses, but they have really tiny arms and they have really kind of flat faces. They're rather recently discovered, but they're dinosaurs like Carnotaurus. I like those. Your husband might know what Carnotaurus is. So I'd say those two off the top of my head. Um, what is your favorite TV show? Ever? Either way, either a recent one or of all time. Best old one was Sergeant Bilko. Um, go into the middle and I would say Seinfeld. Recently, The Office, uh, the office or Parks and Recreation or 30 Rock. I'm not sure which of those three I would consider the best, but all three of them I thought were absolutely brilliant. I really love TV though, and so it's really hard to hard to say, but those roughly. Have you seen Deadwood? Never got around to it. Um, I should because of the language. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I, that's what I was going to ask was, um, I, I read somewhere that they had transformed the, the sort of older language that would have been more accurate. They were trying to go for the same kind of shock value uh, in speech that would have uh, like a respectable member of society would have heard people in the old West as speaking like. I kept hearing about it and it was my, my technology situation at the time was such that it was kind of hard to sit down and watch. And now it's getting old and there's so much else to watch. One of these days I have to take a look at it. And, and finally, uh, how did you acquire your particular love for studying profanity within language? 
Um, I don't have that love, actually. That's not what I'm supposed to say here. But the truth is, my agent came up with the idea of writing a book about profanity because he thought people would enjoy it. And then I decided I would like to write it because I like cursing. And also, people always want word histories. And I always say, you don't really want them as much as you think. You know, after about four etymologies, you'd start to get bored. But this was a way of giving people nine, it's really 12 etymologies for words that are interesting. And because of the way they're used, often their etymologies are interesting. You know, so if you take a word like, you know, chair, well, it goes back to some word that meant chair that sounds a little different. That's not interesting. With most of the curse words, the history is more interesting than that. So it allowed me to give people their etymology in a way that they would actually enjoy. And finally, is there anything uh, I, I know, again, that you, you take this descriptive view towards language. So I'm not going to say, are there errors that you hate, but rather, is there a common phrase you hear that you feel that could be more precise in some way or that people are not truly communicating what they think they are and you wish you could just give them a better phrase for it? Um, people are communicating it when they do this that I hate, but it's just it doesn't make tidy sense to me. You just can't walk in there and say you're leaving. No, you can't just walk in there and say you're leaving. You shouldn't put the just before the can't because that means you simply can't. You simply can't go in there. That's not what you mean. You mean you can't up and tell them. They're two different things. If you say you just can't go in there and, and, and say you're leaving, that's one thing. If you say you can't just go in there and say you're leaving, that's another thing. But people do the just wrong or just don't stand there. No, no, don't just stand there. I hate that but nobody listens to me. <laughs> well, uh, we listen to you. So John McWhorter, <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you on High Noon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Nine Nasty Words is available now from anywhere that you get your books and The Elect is available from John's Substack, which I highly recommend. Um, John, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Ines.